works and draws closer to you with every step we take. Thank you, God, for everything. We love you, Lord. Amen. Before I begin the message today, I want to share with you something amazing that's happening or that has happened already um, on the other side of the world in a uh, town called Nairobi. Uh, in 2016, um, Jonathan and I went to Nairobi, and uh, from there we traveled another 4,000 hours to another little place, and uh, it was just only an hour away, 4,000 later. And um, there we uh, met this um, gentleman who had traveled from Nairobi uh, to be a part of the Bible conference that we were doing. It was a church planners conference, and uh, he, he showed up on uh, day two or three of this conference because he had heard that uh, God was really moving in the area. And really, it, um, to get from where we were um, by, by bus, which is what he took, was uh, about a 14-hour uh, bus ride and then about another hour motorcycle ride, uh, give or take. And so he, he traveled all day to get there. And through that, through that time, we had the privilege that day of leading him to Christ. <laughs> he came to help plant a church and come to find out he did not even know Jesus. He had been playing uh, the part. And so we led him to Christ on that day. And he went back to Nairobi and we have stayed in contact with him constantly. He's about uh, Jonathan's age, just a little bit, or is he a little bit older? Just a, a couple of years older than Jonathan. And we uh, I began a mentor process with him and, and the process looks like this, guys. Here's, here's how I do it when you wanna be a church planner under the banner of the crossing. It's about a three year process uh, for the first year I'm in contact with you every week. I uh, carry you through a course of understanding and studying the, the principles and the systems of planning a church. For the second year, I am in contact with you once a month. And during that time, I am answering questions and I, I teach according to what you need. First year, I'm gonna tell you what you need. Second year, you tell me what issues you're having. Third year, basically is a relationship building time where I, I, I plant them as a, as a pastor and help them to understand that, you know, uh, now we are co-workers, co-laborers. Co Fast forward four years. And uh, this young man has, has joined forces with a, a, another group of pastors in the area and they started earlier in the year, about six months ago, uh, with the plan, the goal. See, four years ago, they, they, he started meeting and he started growing. Well, now he's had some others that have come alongside him. About six months ago, they all came together and, and uh, jailed to, to form another uh, a body of believers. And he has submitted to the authority of another pastor, local pastor, that has been pastor for a long time, um, but had never planted a church. And so they have this, they have started planting a church, and they met in, a, in an apartment. They've met, met um, outside. They've met um, anywhere they could find a place to meet. Six months ago, uh, they were able to get a, a plot of land, and it was covered in rocks, just rocks everywhere construction rubble basically is what it was and they built a structure um, we would call it today a pole barn okay are you familiar with what a pole barn is you know basic tin structure okay and uh, imagine this like this except um, it's 40 feet wide and uh, about 60 feet long and uh, about this height, maybe maybe a little bit higher, with a tin roof and tin sides, okay, and a door back there and a door here to let air go through, okay. And some of the roof has got 
different things to let sunlight come in. So they, they constructed that over the, over the rubble, and they built that before they cleared out the rocks so that they could work in the shade. Cool. And so now they're working in the shade, and they've cleared out a whole section, and, and uh, it's about, about as big as our stage here is now. And, and they have gone in there and packed down the, the, the dirt and made the dirt almost as hard as concrete, very, very hard, packed down, and they started to clear out as they can little spaces like that. They needed electricity. They needed uh, a musical instrument. They, they wanted let's say they wanted electricity and they wanted a musical instrument and they had um, bartered and borrowed some funds to to make the structure okay all in all for the electricity for the key uh, for the keyboard and for the microphones and things like that and and to build the the whole building the um, the 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 total was in American money, $1,500. And so um, they wanted to have their first service today and they wanted their first service to be debt free. So they met today and brought everybody in and took up an offering. And uh, today the church that you started in 2016, four years ago with one guy, who got on a bus and then a motorcycle and then walked, heard the gospel, got saved by the gospel, went back, started working, joined some other people that were already working as well and put together. Today they packed out that place and today they raised $1,078 of their, of their uh, 1500 now this is in this is in Nairobi, okay. So that to give you an idea, that's one hundred and ten thousand of their dollars. To give you an idea, they make two hundred and fifty of their dollars a week. Are you with me? This is huge. So he he videoed me with the pastor and they were standing there with the pa and it was two o'clock their time because it was during band practice this morning and um he videoed me and he said he said uh pastor we uh, or dr ray we almost made it we we raised nearly twelve hundred dollars i mean nearly eleven hundred dollars we're still four hundred and twenty dollars and i'm translating to english so you'll understand and um to two dollars i mean and, and um he said, but we, you know, we're, we're still excited. And I said, well, don't you worry about it. Your sister church, the Crossing Baptist Church in Ohio, is going to pay that other $420. You tell everybody there that uh, we're going to take care of that. And uh, he put me on microphone, put the phone on microphone so I could tell the church. And I told him, be encouraged. We're fired up. We're right behind you. And we're going to take care of that. We're going to pay for that. Um, uh, today. So y'all go ahead and count it as done. And so they get excited over little things like lunch. You should have heard them when they got, when, when I told them they were going to be debt free today because of the crossing. I got excited. Now I didn't put you on the hook for anything, by the way. When I said the crossing, I meant me and Shinova. Okay. Shinova and I are going to pay that 420. Uh, she worked at a yard sale to, yesterday. And um, we're going to take a yard sale money and give it to them. Okay, baby? There you go. If you would like to contribute, you may. Give the money to Shinova. Okay, but if she doesn't get any, we're taking it out of the yard sale money. But, but I wanted the Crossing Baptist Church to have, to know, okay? To, for them to know. That's what I wanted. For them to know that the Crossing Baptist Church has got their back. Amen? And so um, I, I tried to say by and things like that they were excited and everything and life was good and they're excited i mean do the math somebody do the math 250 dollars a day uh that's two dollars and fifty cents a day divided by uh 420 dollars somebody do the math some of my th they make two dollars and fifty cents american money a day They make $2.50 a day 
we gave them 420. So it's 170 days of labor that we gave them. Yeah. Mm. That's half a year. If you work every day, if you work every day, we gave it to them today. Now, you want to be a part of that blessing, talk to Shanova. If you want me to have all of it, just that's fine. I'll take it. I just wanted you all to know that we are committed to missions as a church, guys. We're committed to missions. That's going to be really important on September the 27th when we come together because we're going to have a family meeting on September 27th. And it's going to be huge. We have got some announcements to make on September the 27th that the ministry leadership team is trying to get together. And we will have by then. That will give us, what, two and a half, three weeks to get together. And we're going to have some huge, uh, I mean, big, life-changing, life-altering uh, announcements to make on uh, September 27th. You will want to be here for that day, September 27. You, if you're within two-hour driving distance, you will want to be here on that day. Um, Deacon Don has challenged me to write a history of some of the things. Uh, he, well, he said all the things. I'm on <laughs> some of the things that this church has done in the past uh, five years. We're we're gonna. We're, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm working real hard to write a history just of the past five years of some of the things that we have done. And uh, that's going to be part of what we talk about on September 27th. You will want to be here. I don't know if we're going to have food or not. I mean, <laughs> we're going to meet together. Might as well eat, right? Uh, goodness gracious, we, if we didn't, we get to heaven, we're going to be put in the, you know, backslidden Baptist part, and they're going to point back to that day. You did not eat, had nothing to eat, had them eaten. So... Um, uh, ladies, y'all get together. Oh, that was pretty sexist of me. Uh, people, y'all get together, and uh, whatever y'all decide, we'll eat, okay? Um, and so that's September 20th, and you'll want to be here. I mean, the only, op only option is that it, you're not here and you're in North Carolina. <sighs> Today we get a bonus day with the Fleshers. Yay. This really is the last time. This really is the last time. Uh, until, yeah. Until the last time. Uh, that's like my mama. I'm going to tell you one more time. But she always told me again. So, uh, so, boy, that got bad all of a sudden, didn't it? <laughs> Yay! Fleshers are leaving. Boo. Well, let's talk about something good. And if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. Ooh, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Let's just jump right in. And I asked the... Um, um, I found this on my Bible study program, and um, I asked the uh, tech team if they would come up with a slide for Mark 9:43. I, uh, I see they didn't even try. <laughs> Just think, you didn't even look, did you? Didn't even look. God bless your pointed head. Didn't even look. <laughs> didn't even look. So there is no slide for Mark 9:43, but we're going to read it from uh, from your Bible. Mark 9, 43, you'll want that. I'm reading from the uh, CSB, the Christian Standard uh, Bible. I could also read it from the King James Version out of my own head. Um, if, um, thy right, if thy right hand causes, if thy right hand offends you, cut it off. Here is if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. Mark 9, 43, you want to highlight that. That's what we're going to talk about. And uh, in my van is a sword for the invitation. Hmm? Now, I hope we don't need the sword. But if we do, my son was too eager to get the sword. Just say it. <laughs> the Bible's clear. Your right hand messed up. Cut it off. Ooh. <laughs> He's preaching next week, by the way. You don't want to miss next week. Um, we have a funeral uh, wedding uh, in Tennessee, and uh, uh, Shanova and I will be, be gone. I mean, you wear the same suit. They got pallbearers, groomsmen. It's the same thing. Uh, somebody dies. We're supposed to die. Um, but Jonathan's going to be preaching next week, and, and I think he's going to talk about what is the greatest weakness of Christianity. Is that right? Is that the title? That, or what is the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of Christianity? We've been talking now for a couple, two, three months about this message. 
and I'm going to be FaceTiming. I, I'm not FaceTiming, Face Live booking. Um, and I'm going to, I can't wait to see how he pulls this all together. I'm excited about it. Um, are you at Mark 9, 43? Yeah. I hope you are. Um, I'm going to be doing some reading because the words that I want to use need to be precise. Okay? So if you will bear with me, sometimes I'm going to be looking at my notes to make sure I say it right because I want you to understand what this passage means. I'm going to start by defining salvation. Salvation is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. It's not of works. No one can earn it through merit. It's a free gift of God because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Okay? But what does salvation look like? Salvation is in short the actual def the actual definition it's deliverance from sin deliverance from the guilt of sin and also from that that you can be saved so that you will not continue in sin deliverance from sin Deliverance from the guilt of sin. And we're also saved so that we will not continue in sin. Okay? It's deliverance from the power of sin, the punishment of sin. So, listen carefully. If then any man is saved, he is delivered from the reigning power of sin. It is not possible, therefore, that man should have salvation and yet continue to sin. I'm going to say that again because that is the watershed moment of Christianity. If then any man is saved, he is delivered from the reigning power of sin. It is not possible, therefore, that any man should have salvation and yet continue to sin. I'm sorry, continue in sin. I heard my pastor, Brother Abney, put it this way. Jesus Christ came to open a hospital for sin six souls. Amen? Not that they may remain sick in a hospital, but that they may go out of the hospital healed. Oh, we, we like the fact that church is a hospital. What's the purpose of the hospital? Not to have you a place where you can stay sick, but to have a place where you can get healed. He came not to take men to heaven with their sins, but to purge them from their sins and so to make them fit to enter into heaven. So, all of that. While Jesus denounces, and we should do, all trust in, uh, for salvation and merit, he describe, declares that no man is saved who tolera tolerates known sin. I've practiced this on a couple of people already. And it's right there that most of them stand up and say, what? Well, everybody sins. Yeah. And if you tolerate it, you're not saved. I'm making some proclamations. I'll make some biblical confirmations later. But these are the basic premises that if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. 
This is the basic premise of what that is. Okay? All the gospel declares that a sin, that a saved person does not tolerate known sin. Not only does the gospel declare it, but every single thing about the gospel implies it. You cannot, you ought not consider yourself to be saved. And you can't say that you're truly saved while you live in the indulgence of sin. You just can't do it. So today, looking at this passage of Scripture, if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. I'm going to urge you, therefore, to give up your sin and all that leads to the sin. And it's not because giving up sin is a means of salvation. No. No, no, no. You can't live a good enough life to be saved. Okay? But giving up sin is evidence that you are truly saved. When you give up sin, it's a sign of the work of the Holy Ghost that's within you. So, I'm going to begin with, um, <laughs> begin. <laughs> that wasn't even the beginning, okay? All of that was just the introduction to, to tell you what this passage is talking about, okay? The the first thing that I want us to look at is we need to identify the issue. The text says, and if your hand causes you to fall away, you got to identify the issue. So the, the, what we're talking about, that next slide, uh, what we're talking about here is that word, or the only slide, my slide. Did you delete my slide? Thank you. You are killing me. You want me to use my little clicker thing? Yeah, that's the only slide I got. But never, ever, ever, ever say anything about the tech team. Never. Because they all lean back in their chair. Do it yourself, big boy. Yeah. <laughs> now I've done it again. God bless me. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about sinning. <laughs> Not pointing any fingers. But the word there that's that's used that you know that is translated here, uh, fall away or cause to stumble or offend, it, it's the word. Let me say it in English for you, and you tell uh, say it in Greek for me for you. And you tell me if you know the English. Scandalon. We get our word scandalous, scandal from this word. It's used and translated different ways all through the scripture, okay? It's the same word, but it's translated pitfall, trip over, cause of sin, obstacle, stumbling, cause of stumbling, stumbling block, and the biggest one, offense. Or offense. So this word um, that we're talking about here, if your hand, that which you value, that which you hold dear to yourself is a stumbling block. Now, would you agree that it's valuable? But what if it became a stumbling block, even though it's valuable? Cut it off. Matthew says that Jesus at this point said, cut it off and throw it away. Okay, we're, uh, you know, Mark and, and uh, it's just cut it off. Well, they're both correct. I mean, Jesus said, cut it off, get rid of it. Remove your hand. He says, pluck your own eye out and throw it away. If it offends you, it's better to die maimed, deformed, and go to heaven than to go to hell holding that which you hold dear. That's huge. It, and if your right hand is something that causes you to stumble or, or something that, that is blocking you or, or, or something that you constantly trip over, constantly, constantly, constantly trip over. You got to deal with it. 
Identify the issue. Here's the fun part. Oh, I had a list of issues to help you identify them. And then I hit, it hit me. That which I may think is a stumbling block in my life might be something that you don't have an issue with. And vice versa, right? So uh, that whole section was deleted from my sermon. It's gone. I'm not going to try to list all the different possible sins that could cause you to stumble, cause you to fall, cause you not to serve Jesus Christ, cause you to literally not be saved and enter hell because of it. You, are you following me there? Well, it's big. I mean, he's saying point blank that there are some things on this earth that, that are dear that we need to deal with, and we need to deal with it severely. Cut it off. Cut it off. Bottom line, we all have some besetting sin. Somebody say amen. We fall into all, we may fall into all sins, okay, but some people are more disposed to certain Offenses than, than, than others. Okay? So here's the point. If you have any sin that has been dear to you up to this point, as dear to you as your right hand or your right eye, according to this text, it's time to deal with it and deal with it at once. But I hear you. There are some that are not ready to, and they have reasons. Reasons why you refuse to heed Jesus' warnings this morning. I want to give you just, just a few of the reasons why today you will walk away with your right hand. Number one, necessity. Some sins appear to men to be necessary to them. What am I going to do without my right hand? You know, Jesus didn't say if your appendix offends you, cut it off. Okay? That's just point blank stupid. If your appendix hurts, cut it off. Everybody does that. But he's talking about something that you think is necessary. Your right hand. He's talking about your eyes. He's talking about your legs. These are not things that people go, oh man, I've got a splinter. Well, just cut that thing off. It hurts. Get rid of that. My hand won't hurt anymore. No, he's talking about things that you hold dear. And a lot of people think that the right hand is necessary. Are you with me? Let me, let me make some practical application. Might not hit you, but if you open up, it may. Okay? Certain trades or lines of businesses have a habit of telling white lies. I've got to do this for my business. Or they may indulge in some company things. Well, I've got to go out and have drinks. That my, you know, that's, that's how you make sales. How can I survive in this business world unless I do so-and-so just like others do? It's essential. It's necessary. If you're going to be in this world, it's a cutthroat world, you've got to live like them to level the playing field. It's necessary. Well, my answer is that if, if the thing is wrong, even though it appears to be necessary to your livelihood, just like the right hand is necessary um, to, to the body, you still have to deal with it. For you and your sins must part, or God and you must part. Choose. 
cut it off or spend eternity in hell with it. There can be no salvation. Listen to this. You're not going to like this at all, and I'm going to get some text and emails over this one. There can be no salvation to one that harbors sin. If you're not willing to give up sin, then you need to give up hope because there is no hope for you to go to heaven. I told you you wouldn't like it. I know people don't go, yay, yeah. Uh, that sin may be useful to your livelihood, but it's going to cost you your eternal life. So some people see that their sin is necessary, while other people see and the reason they can't cut it off is because it's natural. Sin is part of me. It's who I am. It's become a habit. If I give up that habit, some people may say, if I cut that off, then I'll be a different man from who I am. This is the way that God made me. It's impossible possible for me to, to change. A leopard cannot change its spots. I've, I've heard that too many times. You know what my response is? I can't find anywhere in the Bible where God commanded the leopard uh, to change its spots. He just didn't. But he did tell us to. The things that we think are natural... I don't have a list, but let me just hit a couple. Anger. That's just the way I am. I lose my head. I mean, I, I, I pastor, I just, I, I just, I'm just quick. God just made me quick tempered. Stop it. Cut it off or go to hell. Those are your choices. I mean, it's, 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 I told you that these words were on the outset seemed cruel, but wouldn't you rather God just tell you straight up, if, if, you, if you like that and you don't want to do anything with that, then you can have it for all eternity, just not my house. Somebody say amen. He's telling you up front, if there's anything in your life that you think is natural and it's a sin and you choose that over following him, I'm telling you, you will burn in hell. And that's horrible to do. Even if, I like this part, I like, I thought long and hard about this. Even if it's impossible, God tells us to do it. If you can't change, if you were brought up to, your first reaction is to, is to be mad, and that's how you've been in your entire life, and, and you have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and turned over a new leaf and turned over a new leaf and turned over a new leaf, if something is going on in your life and, and uh, you've tried and tried and tried to give it up, and you just say, preacher, this is just who I am. This is how God wired me. I've heard that. This is how God wired me. These are my, this is my genes, my DNA. To change who I am would change my chromosomes. It would change my, the very existence of my body. Well, I've got news for you. Change it. Because that which you call impossible, if he tells you to live a certain way, his spirit makes it possible. Amen? So that's awesome. That means that you have access to the power that will rescue you. You know what that's called? Salvation. It's really cool. It's really, really, really cool. I just can't love them. You're not saved. If you refuse to obey God, refuse, I cannot, will not do that. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you need to get that relationship now or burn in hell with it. I didn't have anybody that I tried this out and say, boy, that's going to be a good one. Nobody said this is going to be good. 
Not a single pastor said, will you preach that at my church? And that shocked me because usually stuff like this, other pastors are like, oh, come preach it. No, they didn't want it preached. Deacon make it say. Then the whole world's messed up. Because if that person over there that's really good isn't saved and then they get saved, what does that say about us that are not as good? I'll tell you what it says. Every sin must go. And the sooner the better. How do you get rid of sin? Observe how Christ said to do it right here. I like this part. My favorite part of the whole thing, cut it off. That's radical. That's impossible. You're right. Do you have a better way? I mean, a better way than the master. Well, of course you have a better way. Here's what the world tells you. If your right hand is valuable, needful, and so much part of you that you should not cut it off completely, instead, you need to take a vow not to fall into such a sin as that anymore. You need to not cut it off, but tie it up. Oh, yeah. Tie it up. Put it right here. Yeah, tie it up. If your hand causes you to, to, fall, to fall away, you need to secure it. Let it move a certain amount. Let it go here. Let it go there. Let it do this. Don't let it reach out there, but just reach out there. Just set boundaries, set limits so that it will only act up to a certain extent. Don't let it go too far. Only one drink on special occasions. Moderation. That's the key. My soul. If you can moderate your sin, that's not good enough. That's impossible. He didn't say tie it up. The world says not only tie it up, set limits and boundaries, cover it up. Mm-hmm. What you do at your own home, in the privacy of your own home, with your own spouse, with your own kids, that's your own business. It ain't none of nobody else's business. After all, you ain't hurting nobody. It's your body. You can do what you want. Pro-choice. It's your life. You can do it, live it however you want. Pro-life. Modesty. That's the key. My goodness, if you think covering up your sin is good enough, then you haven't listened to the master's sharp and cruel but very needed words, cut it off. Stop it. I like how Matthew says, and I'm going to come back to the guy again. Matthew says, not just cut it off, but you've got to get rid of it. You've got to throw it away. As if that, that, that union being dissolved wasn't enough, now it needs to disgust you so much that you just have to get completely thrown away. Um, so the picture that Christ is painting here is that after he has cut off his arm, after he's plucked out his eye, that, that he, he cast it away from him. It cannot be restored again. After his foot is cut off, it can't grow back. It's the final sentence of separation between the man and his sin. It's final. It's, it's done. Lay the pack down. Don't pick it up. Stop saying the word. Stop viewing the screen. Don't put it on. It would be better to go to heaven without an iPhone than to live on earth with porn and spend eternity in hell because of an iPhone. Stomp the iPhone. Cut it off. Radical. Pastor, I, I, I can't live without an iPhone. Impossible. Everybody uses an iPhone. Necessary. Cut it off. 
Now, I want to talk to you, some of you today that have been thinking about going to heaven, but you're never going to get there. Well, you are what you are. I'll say that again. I want to talk to some of you today who have been thinking about going to heaven, but you will never get there while you are what you are. You are used to your sin. It's become part of you. And if you don't cut it off, you will not get to heaven. These are the words that are printed for us in your scripture. Even something as valuable as your eyesight. If that is a stumbling block, give it up. There's no excuse. There's no use in playing around with sin anymore saying, I'm going to keep it within these bounds. Cut it off and throw it away. Your habit has got to be relinquished or it will become your destruction. If you can't control your temper, my dear friend, you'll spend eternity hot. What if I told my wife, I've been unfaithful, but I've kept it within limits. I'm not going to stay in her house. Amen? If you tell God, I know you want me to give it up, I understand. I'm going to keep it over here, though. His response is, remember this, I throw that stuff away from me. His response is, sin is cast away as far as the east is from the west. Y'all got to get that. And if you're going to stay with sin, guess where you'll be? You choose. Cut it off. Then there's your pride. Some people say, I I'll be somewhat humble. You got to have some pride. Cut it off. Stop it. There's got to be a clean severance between you and your sin. Now, I get it. I do. I get it. This is a hard message and I know what's going to happen. I know it. I just, I've just prayed about this for several weeks now. So I know what's going to happen. Some people are going to see this as a hard message and they're going to turn their heels and they're going to walk away. Well, that blankety blank preacher, I'll never listen to him again. I get it. I'm just a messenger. I, I'm telling you, you either cut it off or you go to hell with it. You either stop the sin or you spend eternity with it, but that sin won't be in heaven. You see? And I know you don't have to listen to me. I know you can turn Facebook off. I know you can sit here and turn it off. I, I know. I know that. But as the Lord lives, the pearly gates will never open to any of you who keep your sins. If you want to cherish your sins and hug your sins, I, one, one pastor I read said, hug your sins. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the picture. You can either cut it off or hug it. Yes, what a beautiful picture. Now, we, we kind of like to say that the sin is over here. and it No, when a sin causes you to stumble, it's because it's close to you. When it's an obstacle, it's because it's close to you. When it's a pitfall, it's because you're close to it. Whew. 
If you give your life to Jesus Christ and you trust in him alone, he will give you the grace to quit them. But if you hug your sins, you may talk about your faith in Christ and you may lie about your salvation experience. But to such things as a real faith and a true experience, you are an utter stranger. One pushback I've had is, are you trying to tell me I've got to be perfect? So let me be clear. Yes. If you find a passage of scripture that says you don't have to be perfect, tell me where it is. If you don't desire perfection, you're not his. Be ye therefore perfect. That's King James. That's at least 400 years old. It's in the Bible. That should be your goal. That should be your desire. You see, if we flip this passage, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If, if, if something is sinful, get rid of it. If it's offensive, get rid of it. If it's offensive to you, get rid of it. What about this? What if... What if something you're doing offends God? And over and over in the scripture, we're told to live a life that is pleasing to him and not offensive to him. Now, if he's telling you to cut something off that's offensive to you, what do you think he's going to do to something that's offensive to him? If you don't desire perfection, you don't really understand salvation. But, sir, because you're nice, a lot nicer than me today, nobody can be perfect. True. But he can be perfect in intention, if not in fact. And there's a real difference between the sin of misadventure and, the, and of infirmity and the willfully wicked choice and sin of men. I'm not saying anybody can live a perfect life. No. One did, Jesus Christ. But my dear friend, this passage simply means that if anything in your life is sinful, get rid of it. And that is an evidence that you have salvation. It's not a securing of salvation, but it's evidence. Well, preacher, I'll tell you, I'm just as good as the other people. And there's always somebody that can excuse their own sin simply by looking at the sins of God's people. Those hypocrites. I mean, I, I really do think that there are people out there that, that, that watch God's people wanting them to sin and they're sitting there eating a bag of potato chips. Just, you know, mm, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I see that, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes over there, he got mad. Yeah, yeah, got mad at Walmart, sure did. I, have you heard about that? Y'all ain't heard about it? I did. I heard all about it. Let me tell you about it. Okay? And yeah, those are people out there that are comparing themselves to other people. But the genuine child of God, if he hates sin, uh, he, he hates himself also when he sins. So while they may be pointing their fingers, oh, you little hypocrite, we're pointing ourselves at our fingers and says, I'm more than a hypocrite. I'm a horrible human being. You don't have to tell me I'm a hypocrite. I've said this before and people really just gloss over it. Uh, I've been accused of some stuff that's been not true and I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it again. But there's enough true stuff about me that could get me fired. There's enough true stuff about me that people would like, what, and just kill me. It'd be better if you were dead, okay? So you don't have to make up stories about me. I'm a horrible human being. And if you don't believe me, just ask the devil. He's got a list of things I've done. But if you ask Jesus, he'll say, well, that boys he's perfect. Except for his pride. 
Now he doesn't have pride. I stink. See, he's perfect again. Ah, now he's got pride. Hope y'all caught that. Some of you are like, is he talking to himself? No, kind of. <laughs> kind of. But if you are really a true son of God, true son of God, you will hate the sin that's within you more than the hypocrites, more than the lost people hate it. A saved person would be perfect if he could. When you get saved, you don't, it's not that you don't sin anymore. When you get saved, you sin more than you want to. So sins that offend have got to be given up at once. We don't have time to wait. Now is the day of salvation. So I want you to check yourself right now. I want to tell you that during this message, the Holy Spirit has been dealing with you all through the message. And Satan has been talking to you all through the message. The Holy Spirit has been dealing with you, pointing at things, pointing at things. And the Satan's been pointing at things, saying, oh, you don't do that. Oh, what's he talking about? You, you, know, you don't even drink. You don't do this. Blah, 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 blah. And the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, you don't, but this is what you do. And this is offensive. It's a sin. Quit harboring this sin. And what's happened inside of your brain is you can't imagine your life without it. And I know I hit you. And I know that stung. But I want to tell you what you need to do right now. Right now you need to meet the master who said cut it off. And if you're saved, you will not be able to imagine life with it. No matter what it is. But your entire goal in life would be to live your life for the master. Jesus Christ. He died, get this, so that you could stop the sin that you hold so dear. So come on. Cut it off. Let's throw it away. It's our tradition to have an invitation to sing. If you've noticed the song selection, Heath asked me, he says, what's your message about? I said, well, it's about everybody going to hell. And I says, this, it's this passage. So what did he sing? Grace is greater than our sin. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I offer you grace this morning. Whatever it is that you're wrestling with, whatever it is you're going through, the same grace that provides for you an opportunity to walk with the master. And you may have to hop, but you'll be with it. Will you come? Stand. Whatever decision the Lord lays on you. Can be seated. You can be seated. I'd like to take a moment and thank those who are given online or through the app and remind you that you can do the same. We're going to continue by taking up our tithes and offerings using the buckets on your way out. So please feel free to do so. And uh, I was prepping for this talk and uh, came across Luke chapter 6. And there's a, a, a parable in there that uh, it's, it's wedged between two parables I think we've all heard. Uh, the parable itself, I'm, I'm not going to get into, but I encourage you to look it up on your own time. But the, the end of it, there's a verse. He who is, can be trusted with little will be trusted with much. And that's been stuck with me all week because 
I, I don't know about y'all. I would like to be trusted with much. I would like that. that what a privilege, what an honor. That would be incredible. And I feel like I have little. <laughs> Can I be trusted with this, with what I have? And so I've been looking at my time, looking at my resources, looking at, at stuff I, I can do and I'm not doing or I'm doing instead. And I find myself lacking in areas. I find myself trying to get better at those things. And I, I want to use this as a time to encourage you. And I want to use this time that I have, this little that I have, to encourage you to look at yourselves, to look at what you have, what you've been given, little or much, because little is much. And use it for him. Because in his hands, little is everything. It's all you need. Will you pray with me, church? Dear God, thank you. Thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for the, the opportunity we have today to turn towards you and to, to cast away our sin. Help us to follow you with everything we have. We love you, God. We praise you. Amen. Okay, yeah, just a couple of short announcements today. First of all, there's any newcomers today. We're glad to have you. Should have gotten a connection card if you want to go ahead and fill it out at the end of service. Just bring it to the back. And we have a t-shirt we'd like to give you and get to know you and your families. Um, also, we have a family meeting coming up that we Ricky had mentioned earlier. September 27th after church. And it sounds like there will be food because we are Baptists. <laughs> this I've, right. I've decided for the women to be in charge. I'll be sexist. <laughs> women in charge, that's a better way of looking at it. There you go. Women are in charge. Same result. Okay. But that's, that's <laughs> when I uh, first was saved and I was... Uh, Going to a Baptist church, my mom was Catholic, and she cut out a little article for me, and it said that Southern Baptists were the heaviest denomination. <laughs> so, hot box is what does it, so, yeah, this came to my mind. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord God, and we look, look to you, Father, on your throne. And sometimes we forget, Lord, that you're not our friend, that you're not there with us in the trenches, struggling with sin like we are, Lord. We, we forget that you are holy. You are perfect. You are set apart. You don't make mistakes. You don't sin. You don't struggle. We do. Father, help us to see that. Help us to see how far we are from holiness. Help us to see the terrible effects of our sin. Help us to see our sin the way you see it, Lord, because we don't. We've colored it, we made excuses, and Lord, we've, we've drugged people down with us because of our decisions, because of our attitudes. But Father, we just want to pledge to you today that we want to be different. No sin is okay. Show us and teach us and guide us, Lord, so that we really see your holiness and understand what it means to be saved. Father, thank you. We're saved from the wrath we deserve and the power of sin. Help us not to go back to it, Lord. Help us not to look back to it, but help us instead to look to you. We love you, Father. We just ask you to continue to help our church to honor you in what we do and what we say, Lord, and in our attitudes towards sin. We love you, Father.